Good morning. This is Pastor Steve Woodfin from Our Shepherd Lutheran Church in Birmingham, Michigan. OurShepherd.net is our website. And this is morning prayer for July 13th, 2020. We begin by God's grace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we start with God's truth from Psalm 71. And as I read these words, think of them as your own words, my own words, as we thank and praise God for the salvation he has given us in Jesus Christ. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you have I learned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually to you. I have been as a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. And the Old Testament reading comes from Judges chapter 13, the story of the birth of Samson. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. Interesting. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now, just a quick aside here. A Nazarite is described in detail in Numbers chapter 6. So if you're interested to see all the different um, requirements in order for someone to become a Nazarite and what to do um, all the way through the entire um, um, obligation, that's required to become a Nazarite, go to Numbers chapter 6. And interestingly, in that whole chapter, the only thing that doesn't describe the Nazarite is what ultimately is called the Aaronite blessing or benediction, which I will say at the end of this devotion today. And so uh, check out Numbers chapter 6 to see what a Nazarite uh, is required to do. And, uh, and we see in God's word that Samson is the only documented Nazarite um, to be mentioned in, uh, in all of God's word. All right, where were we here? <laughs> then the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me and has appe his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from and he did not tell me his name, but he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now, when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, or eat any unclean thing. All that I have commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. 
And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, so that when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son, and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Manoah Dan, between Zorah and Eshtael. Well, more to come in the story of Samson and how God used him to bring the Israelites out of slavery in the Philistines to the Philistines. And our New Testament reading comes from Galatians chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and sat before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the, uncir to the circumcised, for he, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised works also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. And so some divisions within uh, the church and the those who were sent to share the gospel, some who were really still focused on works of the law and not the gospel at all. But Paul saw through that, always focused on the gospel. And in the end, Paul and Barnabas and Titus fully accepted by the apostles as those who were chosen by God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, to the uncircumcised, while Peter and the apostles were to bring the gospel to the Israelites, to the Jews, to the circumcised. By the way, when you hear this, this name Cephas, it's another name for Peter in this next section. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. These were people who believed that in order to be a Christian, you also had to follow Jewish laws and customs, including circumcision. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with me, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So we see even in the very earliest church, there was division, there was some confusion, there was some concern about appearances, 
I think the same thing that happens today as well. But in the end, the truth of the gospel is what they all went to to resolve the situation. And so today too, that truth of the gospel, that light that shines into every recess and every nook and cranny of the darkness that doesn't come from the gospel makes all things clear. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. Now here's one of my very favorite verses, and perhaps yours too. Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And finally, verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Paul writes so clearly and so plainly, inspired by the Holy Spirit, about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it is the foundation for our salvation and none other. That the law only shows us our sin. And you may have heard this before, the SOS. That the law is designed by God to show our sin, SOS. And the gospel to show our Savior, also SOS. And finally, a beautiful writing about the true meaning of Christianity from Martin Luther. Now, the true meaning of Christianity is this, that a man first acknowledge through the law that he is a sinner for whom it is impossible to perform any good work. Romans 14, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Trying to merit grace by preceding works, therefore, is trying to placate God with sins, which is nothing but heaping sin upon sin, making fun of God and provoking his wrath. When a man is taught this way by the law, he is frightened and humbled. There's the SOS. Then he really sees the greatness of his sin and finds himself not one spark, one spark of the love of God. Thus, he justifies God in his word and confesses that he deserves death and eternal damnation. Thus, the first step in Christianity is the preaching of repentance and the knowledge of oneself. Reminds me of the way we begin our worship services. Always with a confession of sins, always acknowledging who we are, always acknowledging that without God, we are forever lost. And then comes in the gospel, as, as Luther continues. The second step is this. If you want to be saved, your salvation does not come by works, but God has sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. He was crucified and died for you and bore your sins in his own body. For by his word, God has revealed to us that he wants us that he wants to be a merciful father to us without our merit since after all we cannot merit anything he wants to give us forgiveness of sins righteousness and eternal life for the sake of Christ for God is he who dispenses his gifts freely to all and this is the praise of his deity and there is the absolution first we acknowledge our sins before God and confess that we are forever lost without him and then in rushes the gospel. Because of Christ, we are saved. Well, let's close with a word of prayer for today. And then we'll close with that, the ironic blessing from Numbers chapter 6. Heavenly Father, we find sweet peace and rest. Despair no more reigns over us. No more are we by sin oppressed, for Christ has borne sin for us. Upon the cross for us he died, that reconciled we might abide with you, our God, forever. Almighty God, merciful Father, who in love has joined us to the precious body of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the water of holy baptism, grant that we may find peace and comfort in being incorruptible, 
even as he is incorruptible. Through that same Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. So rather than just speak the blessing, I want to actually read the words from Numbers chapter 6, beginning at verse 22. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. And remember, because of Christ, we are all part of that same tribe, God's chosen people, with Abraham as our father. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Well, go in that peace today and share that peace with others as well. God bless your day.